So, next speaker we have is Justin Case. You all probably know him uh, if you follow any of the devices that have gotten their bootloaders hacked, uh, some new security uh, pieces that have been uh, hacked in on, uh, on firmware. And he is here, playing with my phone, here to uh, talk about Android securities, security vulnerabilities, and um, exploits. So, take it away. So, uh, um, yeah, Jared Dog was not uh, too specific when he asked me to speak. So, we're going to talk about white lines. <laughs> 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 Um, as you may know, I'm a wine lover, so <laughs> been serious. Um, <laughs> my notes are going to be on the XDA security form slides, the binaries. So if you want to look at this more in depth, um, they'll be there. Uh, the title is uh, Exploit Android: the Good, the Bad, and the Fun. Um, I'm going to be speaking about Android security terms, which uh, concerns today, both the good and the bad. Um, Presentation is not aimed at the security professional. I know a lot of you are not that big in security. A lot of people don't care too much about it. Maybe they should, but they don't. Um, I hope you get across to you that even the small problems with apps and firmware can cause big problems today. Um, I'm going to discuss my little policy on disclosing. And, uh, towards the end, we'll look at a couple of minor looking bugs and uh, see what we can get out of it. Um, the flow, I'm going to tell you about who I am. I'm going to talk about the light side of security vulnerabilities, and the dark side. Uh, I'm going to talk about my uh, disclosure policy. I'm going to run through a couple of tools kind of very briefly. And then move on to a couple of vulnerabilities and then build some exploits. Um, a lot of people know by Jay Case or Justin Case. I'm a little control and jerk online. My uh, really John Sawyer. I'm the father of four, husband of a good wine and bad wine. I'm an Android fanboy and I'm a professional and home security researcher in a full time job. Um, so, we look at the light side of the vulnerabilities, what, what we think is good. Um, Android vulnerabilities actually have a good side, and they're what most of us think of when we hear Android root. Uh, these vulnerabilities allow us to gain root on the devices that we purchase. But otherwise, I'm unable to truly own. Uh, Game root on our phones gives a greater, greater set of uh, capabilities. We get custom recoveries allowing us to back up our devices. We can flash some firmware. We get custom firmware like SignEngine Mod that keeps the latest and greatest version of Android. We can remove the unwanted stock applications, debug, and we can install custom. Kernel is all packed with all the you know, fancy new buzzwords you can think of. Um, on a more serious note, though, outweighing the good side is the bad side. Uh, the same vulnerabilities that give us uh, the ability to rear our phones also expose us to serious risk. While it's true that most Android firmware is, or my true, excuse me, a little bit nervous. Uh, while it's true that most Android malware is lacking in real sophistication, we've had a few cases that actually exploit vulnerabilities. Droid Dream was one of these cases where uh, Android malware actually exploited known vulnerabilities to gain root access. This malware packed two well known exploits, exploit and raising the cage. Uh, these two exploits were also used through a large number of devices. Many devices were able to be rooted for the first time through them. Droid Dream would use these exploits to install a backdoor on your device and gain the ability to install additional malware for the author at any time. Um, a more recent case to show the seriousness of security vulnerabilities would be the attack on the Firefox unit over the Tor network. Uh, this month, some group or some, someone who are now suspected to be a U.S. government agency using vulnerability in Firefox to execute spyware on both the innocent and the criminal alike. This, this firewall uniquely identified the user, reported back to the server, and reportedly controlled by the NSA. Um, I often hear people complain when companies fix vulnerabilities that we use to gain root. Let's step back and think about it for a second. Mobile malware is in its infancy and continue to advance, and we'll see more 
malware taking, taking advantage of these very same security vulnerabilities. But these vulnerabilities can and will negatively affect us. They put us our privacy at risk, they put our devices at risk, and they're essentially part of a broken product that should be fixed. Um, just a little blur of responsible disclosure. This is my personal disclosure policy. Um, it's pretty simple. If I believe a vulnerability can negatively impact the general public in any way, I will attempt to contact the responsible party directly or through a trusted intermediary. If the company is a Google, is a Google partner, I will also disclose them to security at google.com. Uh, Google's Android security team, a bunch of really great people, nice people, and they get the job done if you reach out to them. Um, I will attempt to get a response from the responsible company about three times in the first 50 days. If I'm able to get a response after 60 days, I'll consider releasing an exploit for the vulnerability publicly. If a vendor responds, uh, responds positively, I'll likely hold the vulnerability until a fix has been issued. When I receive an overly negative response, AT&T, I'll Of the two new exploits I'll be discussing today, the first one received no response from the first 60 days, but it does appear to be patched in the latest firmware. The second one was initially disclosed to Cisco in 2012 and then Google in 2013 when I re-exploited it. Both issues have now been fixed by responsible parties. Um, but, you know, most ones are not fixed. So. At this point, I'd like to encourage uh, those with security concerns to consider the risk they may put the consumer at before a public disclosure. Um, I'm going to briefly go over some of the tools that I use. Um, when analyzing firmware, we have many great tools at our disposal. I'm going to talk about the more common ones that many of you may be familiar with, as well as my personal favorite. I won't be discussing many of the other tools, but um, it's not to discount them. It's just simply a time and experience limitation. The first one is from uh, Jesus Freak, Big Ruber. It's a Somali box Molly. I'm assuming most of you. You're active in the scene are pretty familiar with it. Uh, the quote from his site, uh, Somali, Box Molly is dissimilar, dissimilar for the DEX format used by the Dalvik Android virtual machine. The syntax is loosely based on the Jasmine the DEX or syntax. And it supports the full functionalities of the DEX format. Uh, Somali is often used because of its accuracy and the fact that you can make changes and reassemble with Box Molly. Somali's output is Easy to read with some experience, and the project is well maintained by the author. The best thing about it is it's free. Um, the next one I'll talk to you about is the APK tool. I think Connor out there does a lot of the maintenance work on it. Um, quote from the side of that, it's a tool for reverse engineering third-party closed Android binaries. You can decode resources to a nearly original form and rebuild them after making modifications. It also makes working with that easier because the project-like file structures and automation of some competitive tasks like building applications. Uh, APK tool is probably the most used tool for re-engineering Android applications. It packs a resource decoder and encoder with some Somali, and it's a pretty easy to use front-end script. Um, Dex to jar, Dex to jar. Dex to jar is a suite of tools for reverse engineering Android applications. I cannot honestly say I'm very familiar with the whole suite, but I am familiar with the main tool. The primary uses of DEX to JAR is to convert DEX files to Java class files. For those who are not familiar with DEX, DEX is the actual code that is executed in your application, it's the Java executable. Um, these class files can then be decompiled based on Java decompiler. The downside of DEX to JAR is that it is combined with most Java decompilers, the outputs often unreliable. Yet, Dexajar is well maintained and free. I can't complain about this. Um, the next one is JD GUI. I, I will complain about this one. Uh, JD GUI is a Java compiler that takes Java class files and attempts to convert them back to Java source. Um, JD GUI is free, maintained, but for a number of reasons, it's unreliable. Uh, you decompile an app with JD GUI first, we have to convert it from Java bytecode to Java bytecode with something like Dexajar on Dex. These time files converted, the chance for error increases. Due to this, we cannot rely on Dex and Jar and JD GUI to be totally reliable. And at least the price is right, but the output is rarely right. 
Um, this one I'm actually really excited about. It's called Gem. It's a new one. It's from uh, Android Dash Compiler.com. Uh, Gem is a well maintained commercial Android reverse engineering suite. It includes a disassembler with Somali like output and inter interactive uh, direct output to Java D compiler, a resource decoder, certificate viewer, and several, several other features. Uh, Jeb uses an APK tool space for uh, its resource decoder and is uh, generally more reliable than the other tools mentioned here. Um, no one hiding here. I'm, I'm a Jeb fanboy. I really like the author. I really like the product. It's uh, relatively fast and pretty accurate. The downside here runs about a thousand US dollars. Um, it's my tool of choice and it's what I'll be using throughout the presentation. If you want to take a look at it, the author offers demos, and I have a licensed version that anyone's welcome to play with while I'm here. Um, vulnerabilities and exploits. Vulnerabilities are bugs or other weaknesses in software and hardware that can be used to, take, to obtain results other than what the original author intended. The vulnerabilities will be exploited to gain improvement on our Android devices. And exploits are pieces of software that take advantage of these vulnerabilities. And when we root through a device in non official ways, we're using an exploit most of the time. I'm going to walk you to discover a few vulnerabilities and then develop a couple of exploits for them. Uh, yesterday we saw some really good advice. I don't know if you can see that, but um, if you recall our first speaker, Mark Murphy, he gave some good advice. In fact, I just stole a whole slide for it. Um, permission links are serious and common security vulnerabilities in applications and firmware. Permissions <coughs> link occur when App legitimately has access to a protected API when it has a permission and makes it available to other applications in an unprotected manner. Manufacturers just love to give them tools, and I just love playing with them. Uh, the first vulnerability we're going to talk about is just this a very serious permission leak. Um, while it's not a root, root vulnerability in general, one of my favorite vulnerabilities is look for asylum installs. Uh, vulnerabilities allowing install installation of applications are rarely sought after by our community, but they provide a uh, valued potential malware author. They can be used to sidestep market protections against malware. Game permissions not granted to the user originally, and it'll load additional code for the, for the malware author at another time. Um, one route to identifying potential site install vulnerabilities is the audit applications with the install packages permission. This permission allows applications to update or install additional applications and is only granted to applications that come on the system partition or assigned by the hardware manufacturer's uh, platform key. We're going to look at the LG Optimus G today. Uh, this was a really fun one to play with. I played with the firmware about six months before I actually got one, but it was pretty fun. Um, my first step in researching for vulnerabilities is to pull a system partition. I dump it with the ADB and I use uh, APK to disassemble every application. Uh, this allows me to easily grab through or search through the firmware for keywords or other indicators of potential targets. Um, in this instance, we're looking for a sound install vulnerability, so I look for something that has the install package as permission. Uh, this search yielded seven or several potential results, and the LG install service is a rather interesting name. It's not an application I'd ever seen before. This was my first target. Uh, here loaded in Jeb is the manifest for the LG install service. I'm not sure how clear that is, but uh, the application runs to the system user and it has a variety of rather protected permissions. Um, you could easily use that APK tool as the text editor. To do this, you don't need a thousand dollar application. Um, the first thing we know is that it runs in the system user, which is a protected user. It's the next best thing we can get. The second thing we know is that it has several highly protected permissions, such as install applications, um, delete applications, ability to enable and disable applications, ability to clear the data for an application. Um, the last thing I know is a potential attack service. The attack service is where we can actually interact with the application here. This has one, uh, one place to interact with. The entry point is the install service service. 
Um, upon inspection, because obviously this install service has no restrictions as to what connects and interacts with it. And indeed, it does appear to do what the name indicates. This service allows other applications to install, update, uninstall, enable, disable, and set the default app for, for um, applications. Um, we can have our own application connected to the service and perform all these functions. Basically, disable, enable, complete, install, pretty much anything with an app. Um, there was another command that's interesting in the name install system package. System applications would have the ability to obtain check permissions like reboot and install packages. These uh, permissions are only granted applications that are normally installed on the system partition or sign with the OEM's platform key. Um, we can make a quick proof of concept using the service. Um, the code will be available later. Proof of concept will be available right in the back administration. Somebody actually has to look at it. Um, so we build a proof of concept application that reboots the phone. If it installs and reboots, we know it works. Um, here's a little bit of code that we do the reboot. And uh, our proof of concept was successful. The phone rebooted. And we now have a vulnerability that allows us to silently install an application and gain permissions. Generally, only granted to applications installed in the system partition. The unexpected bonus here is the side loaded application was not user uninstallable. Um, basically, means if malware uses this, the user would not be, able, be able to uninstall the malware without the fact that we set the phone. Since this worked, the phone rebooted, we no way of uh, access to protected permissions. So, our little sign install one would really turn to a relatively minor privilege as case. Um, how can we further this more? Well, LG was, uh, in their infinite wisdom, decided to give us this permission called IAS. One of the ways the Android permissions works by granting additional user groups to applications. These groups define what devices, directories, or files that the application can access. LG was kind enough to leave permission to uh, grant the system installed applications. They added requested applications to a number of highly privileged groups, most notably the system and radio users. As I said earlier, the system users next to root is pretty, pretty powerful. Um, at first boot, the app, um, at first boot, an app update or app installation, the Dalvik EDM optimizes the DEX file, the actual executable application to the device that it's running on. Um, this allows faster executable re execution and reduced battery usage. The optimized DEX is what actually ends up being executed and is stored in the data slash data cache directory. This directory is right over the system user group, but these files are only right over the system user. Um, one way we can potentially escalate our privileges further would be to modify the data cache of a higher privilege application. The result would be a modified, uh, our modified code being executed in the context of the original application. Actually, an application that's ran to the system user would be all from the goal. Since we can write the directory and read the file, we can copy and uh, patch it. Move the original, replace it with a patch copy. While patching the data cache is being privileged education has been discussed before, I believe this is the first uh, public implementation of it. Um, the, the group assigned to an optimized DEX file indicates what the user application actually runs as. And the link companion app here, the group is system, which means it's a target for us because it runs the higher privilege than you are. Um, this is a representation of DAO bytecode in uh, a Somali like assembly. Each DAO construction has a correlating bytecode represented here in the hex on the left. Um, Jeff is very handy, allowing us to view both the bytecode and the assembly at the same time. So, this is what I copied that. The code here received notification of a service being force closed and logs it. It's not particularly important. However, it's easy to trigger the broadcast. This is a good code, can it be patched? Uh, this is the patch I wrote here. This patch, uh, since the patch is correlated by code, we replace the previous instructions with these. This code executes the script. When you see the force closed broadcast, the campaign will execute our code instead of its continuing code. Uh, this is a representation of the original bytecode of our patch versus the optimized bytecode. Since we're patching the, the 
stuff with cash, we had to patch it with optimized bytecode, not original bytecode. The conversion to optimized bytecode is uh, beyond the scope of this presentation, but if somebody wants to play with these uh, systems, they're more than welcome to contact me. Um, these are our final patches. The first set replaces the original code with ours. The second set replaces an unimportant stream with a path to a script. Our patches must be the same length as the original, original piece of code that we were patching. In this case, the smaller so we decided to have no, no operations, which is basically what we um, so The research of Giant Poon, to use a name I didn't make it up, was kind enough to share a vulnerability that would allow a system user to gain root access. This combined with the LG install vulnerability and cache packing the attack vector to finish the job. This vulnerability allows the system application to fool the property service and the right stream to the location of our choosing as the root user. With this vulnerability exploited by our AAA whatever script uh, to write the path of our super installer script to the UVIN helper. UVIN helper is will be executed at, will execute the script as the root user the next time a hot plug event occurs. With the Android and battery usage occurs about every few seconds. Going out, shoot, we have our mess and install, install super user for us. The system install vulnerability was primarily exposed to LG several months ago because of the seriousness of it. Um, it appears to be fixed in the latest firmware. Fixed, not really, but uh, this, the property service vulnerability was fixed with the Android 413 update. The escalation vector, vector the patch in the Dalva cache still exists today, and it's not likely to go anywhere anytime soon. Um, this was one of my favorite. This is Cisco AK Connect. If anybody's familiar with it, it's a VPN client that access Cisco's, uh, Cisco's uh, proprietary VPN solution. Um, another topic that Mr. Mark Murphy touched on yesterday was keeping private keys private. Um, here we're looking at an application that the device manufacturer signed their platform key for Cisco. In this instance, it's actually HTC signed this application for Cisco with the platform key granted run as the system user. Uh, this was allowed, done, allowed, this was done to allow the application to run as a higher privilege user to access permissions and devices that require the function of marketing. Cisco AnyConnect is a VPN client for Cisco's AnyConnect VPN solution. Um, I actually found this one by chance. In uh, 2011, I noticed this application was running my HTC Thunderbolt as a system user. And then, as we've seen earlier today, system users are a good potential target. Upon inspection, I noticed the application was executing a busy box binary from the user data partition without performing any uh, interior check. So it didn't verify that it was actually their binary. It just executed it. Um, if we can find a way to alter this binary or replace it, then we have privilege, es privilege escalation to the system users. Um, I continue to use this vector with other sibling attacks in my own private poke around exploit. I use the poke around new phone without anybody else had to see what I'm fine. Um, in October 2011, Android 4.0 brought us the official Android backend restore solution. Uh, this became the perfect avenue to exploit the system and connect with the system user. Uh, this combo provided the basis of the original uh, bootloader unlock for the HTC DNA that uh, unfortunately I never released because I didn't want to kill it. But, um, various developers have used AV Store in, uh, several root exploits. Binary uses this root meaning Android exploits, which use the race condition to write to the local prop. Um, Dan Rosenberg used it in the HCC 1XL bootloader a lot. There's a lot of them that gain write access to it, debug device. And um, Boops and I used it in our first published bootloader unlock for the HCC DNA. Um, ADB uh, Restore became so abused that Google and OEM, OEMs clamped down on it. Removing the commonly attack, the commonly used attack vector and restrict what apps could be restored in what way. What way. This led to the demise of AV Restore exploits. Um, after all the published AV Restore exploits stopped working, by chance I noticed something pretty odd. One of mine continued to work and it kept working up to 4.22. The only difference with this package and others was that mine was a full backup, including the APK along with the data. 
After examining the backup service manager and discussing the occurrence with, the, the occurrence with other researchers, I brought the matter to the uh, Android security team to quickly have my answer. In the case of the backup containing the APK and data, and the app was a system UID app, and the app had no backup agent, the restore would bypass the restrictions and restore whatever I wanted. This small edge case reopened the Android exploits from 4.0 to 4.22 and became known as internally on Google as bug 8833309. This here is that Google's response to my exploit. It's a patch. Um, Using a modified Android backup, we can execute code as a system user with Cisco's application. Or in this case, just as use for shell commands. Uh, we can fall back to Mr. Giant Poon's uh, exploit and gain root with it. In this proof of concept, we use this exploit to exclude from system to root. Um, to use the proof of concept, we restore a modified backup and then run to any connect application. Uh, the first run it will likely crash, but in the second run it will drop a root shell data slash local slash gimme directory. Uh, because I privately disclosed to Cisco, they now do an integrity check before executing the BusyBox binary, and Google has fixed the backup button 4.3. Um, I will have a proof of concept available later that will should root any HTC phone on the market right now, except for the Google Edition HTC phone. Um, with that, I'd like to give a little bit of advice to uh, application and firmware developers alike. Um, minimize your attack surface. The fewer ways someone has to interact with your application, the less chances they get an exploit thing. If you can protect an entry point with permission, do so. If you can eliminate, if you can eliminate an exported receiver or service, do so. Um, principle of least privilege. All requests the minimal amount of permissions needed for your software to work. You really need to run a VPN client as a system user. Does the backup, does your backup solution really need to run as the root user? Of course not. Expose additional APIs to the framework, allow it to work without all the needed privileges. Uh, third party review. Find another competent programmer or a security firm to look at your software. Additional pairs of trained eyes can spot products, problems for your products become published. Um, Hire security staff. If your company is large enough, hire on-site security staff. This is all. This is almost essential for products high risk like a banking application. Um, hire only competent programmers. Is that guy willing to work on Reddit for fifteen dollars an hour really worth it? An experienced programmer will likely make few obvious, fewer obvious mistakes, and will be well worth the money in the long run. Um, my personal pet peeve: respond to researchers. One of the most irritating problems I run into with companies is that they're unwilling to even acknowledge that they received a report of a vulnerability. If you can't discuss the problem, just say thank you and move on. Um, another problem I've ran into, don't threaten researchers, just pisses us off. Um, this is a problem I've had previously. Um, companies threatening researchers after receiving a report of vulnerability. Don't assume we're trying to get money out of you. It cause harm, just say thank you and move on if that's all you can. Um, my last recommendation is to fix your game of bugs. Seriously, fix security-related bugs when you're aware of them. Don't wait for somebody to explode publicly. Um, I'd like to provide special thanks to a few people. Um, Dan Rosenberg, Liz, if you don't know him, you probably haven't used him on a roller phone. If you use him on a roller phone, you probably know him. Um, Bo Ups, he's worked in you know, a few projects, really smart guy. He recently did a Moonshot and his software for HTC devices. Um, Jay Freeman, Sauer, if you have a drug broken iPhone, you already know he is. Um, I spent the last week with him, really awesome. Tell him about Nick and other people in the Android security team, really great people. So, those interested in security, we both have a forum on the uh, XDA. Well, the security work was just starting to kick off. We also have Android security discussion groups on Google with just about 400 users. I have a little bit of time left, it's in my slides, so I made more slides. <laughs> <laughs> kind of worried about that, I don't know how fast this one's all. Um, 
One piece of advice is often give app developers is use ProGuard to obfuscate their apps. Um, while I really like ProGuard, it shrinks the size of your application, removes unused code, renames classes. Um, it doesn't do jack to obfuscate your application. It can actually make your application easier to reverse engineer because it removes a lot of dead code. I really appreciate when companies ProGuard. It makes my life a lot easier. Um, from the same company that made ProGuard, there's also a product called a Dex card. It's like the big brother of it. Uh, it's a commercial product from Sekoa, if I said that right. And it runs about 470 US dollars. Uh, if you have a commercial application, I seriously say look at it. Um, it's cited over hypes it a bit with the hacker protection factor and stuff, but the product itself is actually pretty nice. Um, it's used just like Dex card and easily, uh, it's used just like ProGuard is easily implemented in the closer hand. Dexcard has some convenience, convenience factors, features like um, they're easily implemented on your own, like adding tamper detection, which detects the signature of the application or removing logging features. Um, it also offers a string encryption, on the fly asset encryption, which is really neat. It really makes it really frustrating to try to reverse engineer an application that's done this. The assets are totally encrypted on, on build time, so the strings. No real work besides one line to the file for that developer. Um, but my favorite and the big feature is uh, the reflection feature. It'll automatically go through your uh, by code your application. And uh, many of the calls you made the API, like say you call package manager or whatnot, it will be totally replaced with reflection. Combined with encryption, it's really pain in the butt reverse engineer. Um, burrito root. This is another bonus slide. I, I had another backdoor to this presentation was originally supposed to mention, but um, unfortunately I had to mix it do some political stuff. Um, so, in December 2011, the 6.2 update for the Kindle Fire became patched in the Zero Rush, and I was asked to find another route for it. Um, I began with a bottle of wine and started looking through the binaries that were launched by the NIT scripts at root time. Um, a quick look at the ADB demon. The service that maintained your Android Cloud Bridge uh, showed an interesting property that's highlighted here. It's service.root.amazon.allow. It looked kind of weird, so I decided to take a look at it. Um, a search of the disassembled firmware showed that the property was being used by, by the uh, Kindle Fire in one of the place, and by a broadcast receiver named Easter Egg Receiver. Um, the next step was to take a look at the class, the class and actually determine what it does. Um, as it turns out, the class was pretty simple and it was quite easy to understand. The class listed for a specific broadcast upon receiving it, it would set the property to a one or zero. And we can trigger this pretty easy with a little bit of Java here. This code would uh, send a broadcast to the, the receiver and enable this property. Interesting enough, the, the result was a root shell or ADB. And since uh, USB debugging was enabled by default, the Kindle Fire, uh, plug in your Kindle and untrusted computer, just got a lot more risky. Um, Amazon then decided to try to fix it. They determined the problem with the typo they had with the permissions of the broadcast. Um, the Easter egg was protected by the right secure safety permission, but due to the typo, it was not enforced, along with the receiver, but it was not enforced. Uh, the typo was fixed at 6.2.2. But they still left the permission to the user and were able to re-export it. This is a this is a this is something we're playing with. It's called Jab. Pretty neat. Um, one of my favorite features of Jab is it lets you rename variables pretty easy. So um, I guess I finished a little early. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask them. When I did uh, some work with this morning in Boxmine before, I found that on my decompiled Java, if I tried to run it, I could never get a debugger. And it would be really handy to have a debugger. Do any of these tools have a debugger? Um, I think APK tool might or maybe used to offer a debugger. Connor's right behind you, might know the answer to that. Version 2 will have a debugger. Well, currently right now, 1.43 all the way to 1.52, there's no debugger. But on 2.0, it works fine. The beta 4 will work. 
work in an idea and eclipse. Um, that means you have to change a couple things for that work. Uh, in Tokyo, the Android Studio. Um, sorry. Um, thanks for your uh, application developer. So thank you very much for your list about things uh, which need uh, which need to take care of my program and that. Uh, but I'm curious to know what um, the most common mistake you see app developers make is in regards to not securing their programs. Um, unprotected entry points like uh, leaving broadcast receiver content providers exported by default when there's absolutely no reason to. It seems like a lot of application developers just want their application to work and don't care what else could possibly work with their application. <coughs> And the second most common? <laughs> um, fixing a problem in one version and reverting back in a later version. Thanks. I've seen vulnerabilities fixed, and then three, four months later, updated that phone will come, and the same vulnerability will be back. It was totally reverted. Um, as you did it with, uh, with uh, I think it was the Rage Against Cage exploit in uh, ADB. Never okay. two years later. From uh, your knowledge, which uh, OM has most uh, bugs not closed? I'm half the ask you again to speak up. So, thinking on uh, manufacturers, which one do you think that has most open bugs? Um, root access and so on. Well, there's a big difference in open and vulnerable. I mean, I, I'm going to say most open is probably Samsung just because most of the Google is open. However, within the last you know, year or two, they've really stepped in the ball. If you like Exynos abuse, they patched out in the international version in 12 days or something like that. Something ridiculously fast. So I, as far as open, I'm gonna say them. As far as vulnerable, um, I hate to point any out, but I have to say LG. Um, I personally use a Galaxy S4 but my favorite phone to poke around with is LG because I know I'll find something. <laughs> <laughs> um, recently in the headlines, there's been a whole lot of hacking, cracking, all that good stuff. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk on some state-sponsored uh, state hacking and kind of like what your thoughts are on Android being the largest market share and whether or not it's just going to become probably the largest mobile botnet around. Um, yeah, I am actually, I really love looking at malware. A lot of people are bored by it, so I chose not to speak much on it. Um, I think it's a serious potential for state-sponsored hits. We see uh, Finn Fisher and there are a few other companies that market to uh, governments. Um, I actually considered the business for a little while. I kind of opted out of it after the, the NSA stuff for, with Tor and Firefox. Um, I had been doing business with a Canadian company that was looking for a product like that. But yeah, I don't think we're, there's no any large Android botnets right now that I'm aware of, but the potential is huge. It's just, and the mobile malware authors are just, they're more interested in going after SMS fraud in Eastern European, Europe instead of uh, botnets. Uh, follow up to your comments regarding DexGuard. I've always viewed that as being kind of an arms race. I mean, isn't eventually the, the, the tools that you were talking about earlier, they're just going to figure out how DexGuard does all the encryption and just decrypt all of it? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, the encryption on DexGuard is easy to get around. However, you know, if you're protecting your application as piracy, look at who's doing the piracy. If you're going against a professional or reverse engineer, no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. But most of these pirates, all right, 18 year old kids in a forum that want to get their name out there. You know, in that case, you know, half of them are using automated tools like anti LVL, and you know, with a little bit of changes to the license library, that's in the break. Um, the other half, they have some experience, but you start throwing some weird stuff out there like uh, lots of reflection with encryption, they're going to stop too. I think it took, uh, I, had, I was tasked with reversing an old bad malware for a company. Um, I think it took me a, maybe a day to get rid of the encryption. So I mean, it's it's it's, it's a time race. You want to make it as much of a pain in the butt to the pirate as possible, but you're not going to stop it. Uh, 
um, thinking about doing an app with a web service URL. I was wondering if there's a, a secure place to maybe put the web service URL that kind of, you know, that won't be easy to get to. No. Okay. <laughs> I figured that was the answer. That was an easy one. <laughs> anyway, in that case, you know, you know, I mean, if you can't do any of your security functions on the back end on the web server, that's where you want to do them. And never assume anything coming from the client is not tampered with because it is. Hey, um, uh, first I just want to say thanks uh, you know, uh, for a lot of fun with DNA, especially. Um, but um, uh, kind of uh, so kind of a two part question on on the flip side of what he was saying. What uh, manufactured OEMs would you say um, you know are the most secure and give you the biggest headache you know when you're working on it? Um, I wouldn't be able to point you out. Okay. That's all just. I mean, I, most of them are getting pretty good at updating. I mean, a few years ago, they were all bad. Yeah. I mean, you know, HTC has been in the ball, Sony's been in the ball, Samsung's been in the ball. Mm -hmm. um, I believe Sony and Samsung don't quote me on it because I'm not positive, but the like, vulnerability back up I discussed today, mm -hmm. I think they've already backported the 4.22. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think they've passed that. They don't quote me on it, but mm -hmm. they're both been on the ball. Okay, and uh, the, and just the, the second part was, uh, do you do a lot of the exploits that you see um, result from like some of their custom overlays that they like to put on um, devices? With mine, almost entirely, I, I tend to play in the framework of the Dalvik. Okay. Um, either most of them, I had a couple that were in AOSP, but most of the ones. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, Uh, have you gotten to sink your teeth into any embedded systems? With Android being in so many embedded systems, is that something you're excited about? Um, I haven't had a chance. I mean, if I had the time, I would. But right now, I'm in a position where I'm gone so often that I don't have time to do it. I don't want to answer Connor's question. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think just because the nature of Android being one giant Dalvik in the there's really no way we can make everything secure until everything's a separate sandbox at the end. I don't think there's any way to make everything secure, period. Um, I'm not really sure how to answer that. I think, I don't know. To be honest, I don't know. I don't think it's any worse than anything else. So. And I want to thank you guys. I mean, all my previous presentations have been small corporate, you know, nine, ten people. You know, much easier. I was very freaking nervous on this. So I'm sure show. Yeah. We were talking about this last night uh, over some beers. Um, the uh, the thing he was talking about uh, with uh, the, the beams being the same uh, for all of the machines, like uh, basically the exposed framework, uh, you can replace that exposed framework and basically you compromise the entire system because then you can just install apps which replace parts of apps and it can be anything from Ingress to your banking app and just by reflecting from one part of the virtual machine to another, you end up with uh, just a completely insecure system because the whole thing shares it. Once you install a super user, your phone's completely insecure, you've completely and utterly broken the security model model of Android. I don't personally would mind for that's one of the reasons. I mean you're talking about using an exposed framework with which tampering with low level stuff. I mean your security model is already completely gone at that point. So we won't worry about any of it. I mean Finding vulnerabilities in third-party applications is just you know, is often pretty easy. And if you're running a you know, root application, you've already granted them root permissions. I mean, it's, I wouldn't even worry about anything else. It's already over. Uh, I'll just be a quick question here. Um, I know you worked for quite a while on the Dokomo Optimus G because they had it locked down uh, pretty tight with the SE Linux. And what phone you? The Dokomo uh, Optimus G. I think it was actually another. Access control system. I don't think it was SE Linux, but it was pretty similar. Okay. 
But I, I know we, you got around that just by uh, replacing the boot loader and then getting the exploited shell and then just swapping out the boot loader. How often do you find that companies and uh, OEMs, you know, they work hard to lock things down, but they leave just the top of the thing wide open by letting you just have direct access to the uh, block partitions? Um, less and less now. I mean, you know, HTC allowed it for a while, so they, you know, fixed that, I think, with, you know, maybe with Thunderbolt, maybe it was a little bit earlier than that. Um, Samsung used to do it, but they've locked it down a little bit. I was told today LG is doing it a couple of phones, doing a right protection with some block devices. I haven't confirmed that. But I mean, really, I think that's, well, many of you guys might not like it, it's actually for the best. Thank you. And if you want root, go buy it from the you can log. What's your favorite uh, affordable white wine? <laughs> um, Chateau Saint Michel Versamir. Why? It's about six bucks. <laughs> Can you spell that for us, please? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, well, we got it. Like, oh. How secure do you think Android's you know full device encryption is? Uh, it's pretty secure. I mean, if you look at the people who have compromised it. They're using well-known stuff like their uh, there's a cold brew tack. There's that, or they're uh, just dumping the there's a reserve block at the end of the partition that they dump and brute force it. I mean, if your password is brute force it, it's not secure. But use a good password is probably pretty secure. I use it. Uh, hi, I was wondering. Um do you have a lot of, or you have a few Android forks, and I was wondering um, which one is the most secure? I don't know. I, I, you know Never just, looked at it, or? Well, I, just because I don't find something doesn't mean somebody else can. If you look at somebody like, you know, Dan Rosenberg, he will run through anything, and I can't call it secure. You know, too, so. um, But, I mean, they are kind of presented as being, you know, this is a secure version of Android. You, and basically you're saying, well, that might be so, but you can't tell if they are. Is that the case? Well, you have to trust the company that's doing it. I mean, really, I mean, I guess probably the most secure would be, yeah, I don't know, maybe one of the ones that are going to be running SC Linux, but... That, that's even not, that's just, you know, you do a kernel vulnerability, that's dead too. So it's an arms race. You can't just assume something's perfect security. There's nothing not, and there's no company that can claim that. Look at the ones that fix vulnerabilities first and look for them. Thanks. You mentioned on your personal device that you don't boot your phone because of the vulnerabilities that it causes. Um, are there any other precautions you would recommend for users? Um, Maybe you just, yeah, you know, in this computer, think about it before you install applications. You don't just randomly download stuff. I mean, you know, I hope you don't. Your personal computer is say, oh, this is a game from Samurai.ru. This look, you know, look at the comics. I do the same here. It's some, yeah, look at who, who's the author. I mean, that's not the only reason I don't root my phone. I stopped rooting my phone when they really started working on the VPN aspects of Android. Once the VPN started working, I no longer had a reason to do my phone. So I do it. One more. Last one. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Uh, what's your feeling about SC Android? Um, I hate it, but it's being shipped in permissive mode, which basically means it's not going to do very much at this time. Um, I really hope they don't ship it in forcing. I know CyanogenMod mod is. We're supposedly going to start forcing or shipping in enforcing mode, and it's going to break all kinds of stuff. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Just uh, so you know, he said I couldn't drink the wine. Oh, boo. Yeah, I'm right there. <laughs>
bitter, but...